Hello and welcome to the final part of our incredible voyage along the South African coast on the Azamara Quest. If you watched the first three parts, bravo and thank you. If you haven't yet, we recommend you do. And while you're here, please consider subscribing too, as it really helps us feel loved and fills us with encouragement to do more. Thank you. Sea days are great, aren't they? They provide a rest from all that energetic land-based exploring you do when the ship stops in an interesting location. And my giddy aunt, the interesting locations have been coming at us like a freshly unleashed room full of puppies since we began in Cape Town way back in episode one. Sea days on Azamara seem to burst forth a multitude of activities that can be used to stop you from just falling asleep by the pool, normally involving eating, drinking, browsing the shops, enjoying the wave machine in the pool, sea state dependent, and soon day becomes evening, and this particular evening we're invited to the Grand Officer's Hosting Dinner, where we were guests at the table of the very best person to be hosting you on these particular evenings. No, not the captain, but the head of food and beverage, Fabio. You just know that when you're with this guy, you're going to be served the very best on offer, with a few little extras thrown in. Shh, I'm not supposed to say that, but with a few select words in the sommelier's ear and, well, access to the special cellar was unlocked. After that, we staggered through to the den for a quiz, energetically hosted by the constantly grinning Gemma Rose, and furnished ourselves with a couple of cocktails to finish us off. Pro tip, you're never going to win a quiz after an evening like this. I blame Fabio. He's a very naughty boy. Cape Town at dawn is a spectacle you must witness if you're here. You'll be up early anyway because there's a packed schedule and Cape Town won't forgive a lay-in. Today's adventure took us for a vineyards tour of the Pal and Franschuk Valley. Franschuk means French Corner in Afrikaans and it's easy to see why. In 1688, French Huguenot refugees began farming the valley, which is where the vineyards of today began their lives. Many still retain their French names, and the history of the region is remembered by the Huguenot monument at the end of town. Much of the architecture in the town is Cape Dutch and is strictly preserved and controlled, and it really feels like a posh little piece of France has been plonked here, right in the middle of the Eastern Cape. Not surprisingly, Property prices are high here and it's a magnet for the rich. Franschhoek is the food and wine capital of South Africa and tourists flock here to the art galleries, quality boutiques and world-class restaurants. Our first vineyard was the smaller one of the two on the tour today, the multi-award winning Nederberg estate in Paal. Founded in 1791 by German immigrant Philippus Wolvart, the Cape Dutch Manor House that Wolvart completed in 1800 is preserved as a national monument to this day. This was such a lovely experience. The weather and sitting on the edges of the rows of vines was the perfect backdrop to a delicious and educational tasting. Our second call was the much larger Boschendal estate, one of the oldest in South Africa. Dating back to 1685, the farm features buildings in the Cape Dutch style, dating back to the early 19th century, like Lerone House here. This tasting was much busier and more commercial and didn't feel so intimate. Their procedure of serving all the wines at once before the tasting began felt a bit rushed and ill thought out, as by the time you got to the later wines, 
they'd become less chilled and even warm in the afternoon heat. Strange and a little disappointing, considering the excellent tasting we had earlier. However, the picnic lunch they provided was incredibly well thought out and delicious. So good, in fact, we forgave them for their early butchering of their own wine tasting. It's a hard life indeed when you've had an exhausting day drinking wine and eating good food, but then you've got to somehow summon the energy for the hugely anticipated as amazing evening back in Cape Town. I really don't know how we cope with our first world problems sometimes. What a nightmare it all is, isn't it, darling? <laughs> yes. As Amara's signature event did not let us down. Actually, when does it ever? Coming from the historic city hall in Cape Town, where Nelson Mandela made his first public speech from the balcony after his release from prison to a crowd of almost 250,000, we were treated to an evening of music from the Cape Town Philharmonic Orchestra. Before that, traditional Cape and South African desserts were served in the foyer, with names like Cook Sister, Herzogi, and Twee Gevrici. Forgive my pronunciations. Accompanied by delicious wines from Stellenbosch and Franschuk. Oh, and a tipple or three of Amarula, the South African cream liqueur made from the African Marula tree. Following the classical ensemble, we were delighted to be played out by the Sunshine Entertainers, a traditional troupe of Cape Malay minstrels that quite frankly made you grin from ear to ear with their infectious music and jolly demeanour. Rooted in the origins of the slave history of Cape Town, slaves were only allowed one day off a year, the 2nd of January which was referred to as the Second New Year, and they used that day to celebrate with singing and dancing. Today, the Cape Town Minstrel Carnival is still celebrated on the 2nd of January, and it attracts as many as 13,000 minstrels. What an evening, and we still had a full day left in Cape Town. Our final day and we couldn't resist visiting the Cape Peninsula, which involved a fairly scary scenic coach ride along the Chapman's Peak Drive, a narrow and winding road with very steep sides you need to travel along to get to the Cape Peninsula and the famous Cape of Good Hope. Some of the beaches along this route are utterly beautiful, as is the scenery. Arriving at Cape Point, the first thing you see is the warning about baboons. They may look cute, but apparently they'll near damn punch you in the face if they see a snack you've got in your pocket. We have been warned. What we weren't warned about, however, was that the funicular to the lighthouse was out of action, and the only way up was to wait for a tiny shuttle bus, or to get those legs working. <laughs> they should rename it the Not Much Funicular. Letting those of a more delicate demeanour take the bus, and choosing to climb the labyrinth of steps, we finally made it to the Windy Summit.
There was even a baboon enjoying the view and it looked, up to now anyway, that he hadn't nicked anyone's handbag. Although this one looked like he'd scored some lunch off someone. Who said lunch? Included in this very excursion and thankfully primate free. looking forward to Boulders Beach the most today and I wasn't disappointed. Home to the African penguin, I was shocked to learn that after half a century on this planet, I hadn't realised that penguins live in hot climates too. Mm, it doesn't seem right to me that penguins like to sunbathe, cavort on sandy beaches and enjoy a bit of me time in the surf. Actually, this particular species are currently on the verge of extinction and under protection of the Cape Nature Conservation. Perhaps someone ought to tell them that they're supposed to be cold? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm sure that's not the reason. No. I'm sure of it. Encouragingly, the colony of around 3,000 birds has grown from just two breeding pairs in 1982. So the old adage of sun, sea and set, well, you know, seems not only to be relevant to humans. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Don't think for a minute that the last night on board Azamara South African Intensive Voyage is any gloomy affair, nor is it any less thrilling than all the previous nights. As our very most favourite bar professional Alina was whipping up some cocktails for us, we were entertained by yet another fabulous music ensemble. I've actually lost count of how many incredible local artists they've had on board in this voyage. And that typifies the Azamara experience for us. This voyage has been nothing short of a concentrated cavalcade of entertainment, discovery, wonderment and culture of this country that has made us fall in love with its people, wildlife, scenery and cuisine. If you get the chance of coming here and experience this cruise, or one similar, take it. It more than fulfills its billing of being intensive, but not in a tiring way, more so an exhilarating introduction to a country that deserves to be near the top of people's travel bucket lists. We certainly had not considered it before, but we're more than thankful we've been. And we'd like to thank Azamara for inviting us out here to experience their newest jewel in their already sparkling itinerary crown. If you've enjoyed this series, please give this a thumbs up and please hit that subscribe button and we'll promise to keep bringing you the best in travel and cruising we can. Thank you very much.